Okay, um, just a little bit. I wanted to start with uh, just talking about who I am and, and what we're doing. And um, I'm focusing specifically on Utah because I have a lot of data on Utah. And then I'll just show some maps of other places um, for our Southwest uh, rural US and talk about some um, things that you don't see from a map. And um, what uh, what some of the programs we work with are and how they're working towards solving hunger. So uh, first I'm the uh, Utah Create Better Health is what we call it, SNAP-Ed, it's under the SNAP-Ed um, grant with Food and Nutrition Services. And also I'm the, hunger, the Utah State University Hunger Solutions Institute Director for, for once again, Utah State University. In 2014, I heard Dr. Harriet Giles talk about Auburn's Hunger Solutions Institute, and I found it fascinating, and I wanted to um, start one of my own here at Utah State. So I came back, and I reached out to her a couple times, and we were able to get our university president to sign um, the push, and she's uh, committed to working towards solving hunger as well. Um, we were the first in Utah to, to sign that, so that was kind of exciting. Um, our Hunger Solutions Institute is very small. We love the work that Auburn does. Um, we actually don't have, well, we have $5,000. That's how much money we have. But uh, we decided to go ahead and start anyways, even though we didn't have um, funding um, and work through partnerships and through um, our SNAP-Ed work to try to solve hunger specifically in Utah. Um, we have a few things on campus, which I'll talk about briefly. And then um, even working towards international hunger if our partners um, want to, to create collaborations for that. So the next is just to line up what I wanna talk about. Once again, I want to talk about how in the Southwest US, what hunger looks like. Um, current solutions and how they are working and finding possibilities for growth. Uh, to start us off, we'll talk a little bit about the demographics here. Um, my, once again, my work slowly focuses on the hunger efforts in Utah and what Utah's hunger and poverty looks like, um, I wanna share. So Utah has a pocket of urban on the Wasatch Front and a Southwest corner in St. George on the, um, yeah, southwest, southwest part of Utah. And those are the two areas that have um, our biggest pop pockets of population. We, the rest of it then is rural. And um, the majority of the counties have huge distances, taking half an hour to two to three hours to drive um, between county lines. For example, San Juan County is one of our biggest counties, which also has a huge rate of uh, poverty and food insecurity. And I'm going to highlight that on the next map in just a second. Um, but another important indicator for hunger in Utah is that 65% of households have children, 30% of those households are free, female headed, and then an additional 30% are married couples, married or couples or partners, and 45% of participants have one person employed an additional 42% of participants have two employed workers. Many have more than one job. They're typically working two to three jobs trying to make ends, ends meet. And um, they also are, uh, uh, our, our housing costs in relation to our income is, our housing costs are extremely high and the income is very low. So it's a huge problem and I don't know how you make all the solutions. You have to make some legislation, I'm sure, to make that um, come into, to make it uh, so it's not such a big gap. Um, Utah is not a huge population state or a state with a lot of diversity. It is land-wise, but uh, the population is not. 13% of the population are Hispanic ethnicity and the other populations besides Caucasian, they all total up to less than 5%. So not a huge populate, uh, diverse population in Utah. And so you may see some of that reflect in um, the data that we show. 
coming forward. Okay, so this one is um, the demographics of poverty and why I wanted to show this. Can you see when I move my mouse? Can you guys see that when I move that? On your I remote? cannot. I don't, yo, yes, okay. I do. I do see it. Okay. <laughs> okay, perfect. So I wanted to kind of just outline what Southwest, so we have Texas over Colorado, and here's our Southwest areas. And um, just kind of show, it's also quite a diverse area. Uh, food insecurity in the dark blue are above US averages. In the light blue are below US averages. And in the white are like right on tr target with the US averages. But we all know that um, poverty is, we don't want any um, poverty or hunger in the anywhere. So um, you can't see this through this map, but here in Utah, this is about where the Wasatch Front is. And um, I'm gonna jump to the next slide. Well, I'm gonna show you um, the next slide in just a second, or the slide after in just a second, because I wanna show the county population and you can see um, where uh, here's San Juan County, which has some, quite a bit of pop population of poverty. It's still very low population. And then the Wasatch Front right through here has 72% um, of the pop of uh, poverty is on the Wasatch Front. So there's three main count, uh, counties. There's Davis County, Salt Lake, and Utah County where most of the poverty reside. And 34% is um, Salt Lake County. And then um, if you look at the rest of the map, it is, Utah is, the rest of it's rural. So uh, there's food deserts, food insecurity um, in those food deserts, harder to get to grocery stores, uh, lack of transportation. There's not a bus system outside of the major areas. And so there's issues within itself there. And then I just wanted to share the food insecurity data um, for the U.S. on this other side. That was just for you to see. Um, San Juan County, once again, it's this, this county right here. It has um, a tribal population and 30% of the population in this county is food insecure. Utah's um, poverty hovers around 13%. But as you know, not one person should be hungry. And the annual income for an employee, um, this is a, uh, for a, an employee, a single parent with two children, is around $15,000, which, and once again, the housing costs are so high. So um, not a great situation to be in. Not a way, it's kind of like there's not a way for that family to get out of that poverty without some extreme help. So that's what we're trying to provide. Um, I wanted to show this map. Um, it shows hunger um, in these areas once again, gives you a good glimpse of, of what's happening. Obviously, uh, we have a lot of hunger here. This is both below and um, both low and very low hunger food. <laughs> Sorry both low and very low food security prevalence, which is higher than the national average. And um, the ones in the light blue have low food security prevalence, lower than the national average. And then both low and very low security prevalence, lower than national average as well. So um, it's just a way to look at uh, what, what might be happening in those regions. This next map I think is really kind of uh, telling. As you can see, like once you start heading into the Southwest, the um, counties are bigger. The counties um, have less density. And so the poverty could look a lot different based on that, based on, um, as we talked, here's the Wasatch Front, this, this dark spot, that's the urban area. And um, there's not a lot of poverty there uh, because of the population. So 34% um, of the poverty population lives on the Wasatch Front. 
but the population, this is where most of the population in Utah lives. So if we broke it into little bite-sized pieces, I think we would see a different picture. But right now you can only see one county or one entity that's showing um, the poverty. So I think that's something to pay attention to. The other thing I think is important to pay attention to is if you look at the bordering states, all the states that border um, the edges of the U.S., how much more um, poverty is in those areas. I just thought that was interesting as well and wanted to point out. So this one gives another glimpse of what um, counties look like. Uh, right here is our San Juan County that has the um, higher population, I mean higher poverty rate, but you can't even see the Wasatch Front because the population is big enough that it's not going to reflect how much poverty is right there on these kind of maps. So I want to talk a little bit about um, things that we're doing to work towards it. I mentioned that I oversee the SNAP-Ed program in Utah. Um, it's, this is probably my favorite part to share as is the work that's happening through our Long Grant University. Um, I work in the Nutrition, Dietetic, and Food um, Services Sciences um, Department, and I am 95% uh, of my role is extension. So I'm a full professor within extension, but I work in this department. And so we work very closely with extension. And once again, we provide SNAP-Ed through Utah. Um, we have five prongs to our SNAP-Ed. We do direct ed to adults. We do direct ed to youth. We have um, indirect education, which is our social media. And we do a lot of work, especially now with Corona, we have moved all of our direct ed onto our social media. So um, our teachers that are used to teaching in classes are doing live presentations as well as Zoom presentations. We do policy systems and environment work and we do um, social marketing. And together, um, we take all those pieces together to try to solve hunger and to help the participants have more food security. Like I mentioned, areas that, um, that are affected by our corona is one specifically, specific one I want to mention, our food pantries. Already in Utah, we had a lack of food, um, a, a huge program that used to provide food drives in Utah has been missing since, I would say, October. So we had two food drives that, that were missed, and um, there was a huge need. So another uh, church was going to pick up the food drives and provide them this week, but they're not even allowed to do that. So the hunger is huge and there's a big need for food and a big need to get food out there. So we're working with the food um, bank to do a virtual food drive. And it's kind of cool. You can go in, you get a click, and obviously the food bank can get more, buck for their, more bang for their buck. And so it's a great way to um, meet that need. Pretty excited about it. Um, our direct ed is online. After participants participating, um, I just wanted to mention the results. After participating, participants report that they have enough food to last through the month. So the concepts we try to teach are um, cooking from what's on hand. Uh, so they may be getting food from the food pantry and not knowing how to use it. So we try to teach that. We try to teach um, picking the best items, picking better items than you um, normally would and how that can stretch your food dollar. And then we also try to teach um, increasing your physical activity. So we did some similar things as Kentucky, uh, when we participated in universities fighting world hunger, we came back, this was about four years ago, and we came back and did, started up a campus kitchen, which is still running. It's in partnership with um, a group that already was on campus, our Student Nutrition Action Center. And it's a place where they can, excuse me, access center, 
where they can go get, uh, it's the campus uh, food pantry. And then last year we were able to get a grant to expand some of our work, which is to expand our farmer's market. I mean, I mean our, um, we do farmer's market work, but to expand our uh, home gardening or community gardening, gardening, gardening work. Um, in another rural area of Utah, it's Duchesne County and Uinta, um, distances are such, and a lot of the population do not have vehicles, and so uh, setting up some of the community gardens is done just in their front yards. They're, they're trying to, uh, we're trying to make it just more accessible to the people, and that's pretty exciting. The other thing that we were able to do is to have a hunger discussion in 2018 where we invited faculty, um, on campus people, agency people, community people to come and just have a discussion. And, and that started to get our ball rolling to where we are today, which is still very small. And I get that. Um, right now we post uh, partnership work through social media. We actually, have monthly Zoom calls where we're discussing what is happening um, within each other, asking for needs. So example, um, the Salt Lake County Extension, they have a horticulture program which got, grows food and they're able to expand that food um, and take it to the senior centers. And the senior centers then have a farmer's market, which it's all free and they can come they get a ticket of how, who came in line and and they get to come select food and they they limit the food so that um, like you can't take all the corn or you can't take all the tomatoes so everybody can have a little piece of each and it's it's pretty exciting and pretty successful just in our Salt Lake County we have and just with extension there are like 38 senior centers being served that way and there are four groups that are working on um, various senior centers. So that's not even counting the other three. So that came about from um, Hunger Solutions Institute work and we're working with uh, the extension people to uh, survey their, their senior populations to see if it's helping them and how. So we'll have some great results from that. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is um, some of the campus work that's happening. Just briefly, uh, there's a hunger minor, there's a hunger class, and an honors class, and this is all following uh, stuff that we have learned from Auburn, so thank you very much for that. In the honors class, the students come up with projects and they um, become uh, competitive. Um, in their, it's like a shark tank kind of thing. They, they create a project. I'm a shark tank judge and I get to go and listen to that, their project. And then we give out resources that the teacher has available at, or resources that we have. And it's kind of a cool way to introduce hunger out there. We're able to work with that population a lot. So just briefly, um, there's a lot of programs out there. There's FNAP, it's been around a very long time. Uh, there's food pantries, WIC, government assistance, um, and other assistance. But I just wanted to just talk briefly about the ones that I work with. There's excellent programming in all those areas, but we really want to, I think the way to solve hunger is not by yourself, that you have to work together in partnerships and coalitions. And so that's something that we really try to do and we've found great success. So the next thing that I just wanted to mention is um, one, uh, that there's a lot of stuff that, that you can do even if you don't have funding. Uh, we have that $5,000 <laughs> which we haven't touched. We were going to the, earlier this week, we were supposed to have another hunger discussion, but it was shut down because of Corona. So um, we still have our $5,000 and we will try to expand our work through that. But so far we've been able to get uh, just leverage everybody's resources and work together, including writing grants. And that's something I think anybody could follow and implement is um, looking to what great practices are out there, learning from other people, 
taking that information and, and uh, adapting it to make it work in your own state. Okay, and that is all. All right, everyone. Well, thank you for tuning back in and uh, listening to our session. And the title is Appalachia, Seeing Hunger in Kentucky. And I did pronounce it right. It is Appalachia and not Appalachia. All right, so the Appalachian region is an area just over 200,000 square miles that follows the spine of the Appalachian Mountains from southern New York to northern Mississippi. It includes the entire state of West Virginia as well as 12 other states. Oh, hold on. Okay, so the uh, Appalachian region's economy was once highly dependent on uh, industries such as mining, forestry, agriculture, and chemical industries, but it has become more uh, diversified in recent times and now includes industries such as manufacturing and professional service industries. But poverty is still very much uh, common in the region, but some communities have uh, successfully diversified their economies and meaning that some you know, are more or better off than others, uh, where some communities still very much struggle with the need for basic infrastructure, including roads, sewage, and water systems, which we'll actually talk about later on in the presentation with my co-presenter, Dr. Katie Cartarelli. So these contrasts of communities, some being better off than others, is not really surprising when you consider the, the size and the diversity of the Appalachian region. And also uh, not surprising is that nine of the 13 Appalachian region designated states experienced higher, level, higher levels of food insecurity compared to the average U.S. rate of 12.5%, with the overall food insecurity rate in Kentucky higher than the national uh, average at 14.9%. And in the map on the left here, as uh, you can see, the food insecurity rate in Kentucky ranges from 15 to 29 percent, with the darker green representing uh, higher levels of uh, or higher rates of food insecurity. And in Kentucky, they do predominantly occur in our Appalachian counties, which are depicted in this map on the right. So some reasons associated with the higher rates of food insecurity experienced by um, our Appalachian counties include endemic poverty, lack of regular access to large supermarkets, convenience and the lure of fast food dollar menus, the mountainous terrain lending to geographic isolation, of course, hectic and busy lives, and the limited ability or desire to cook. So with the diversity of the economies and the culture within the Appalachian region, there really is a need for unique solutions to overcome the barriers associated to achieving food security. And one such community initiated program is the Farmers Market uh, Voucher and Walking Program that I have been working with in Whitesburg, Kentucky since 2017. And for this program, uh, we require participants to walk approximately one mile, a community trail. Um, when you complete it, the round trip, it ends at the farmer's market. We give them a voucher uh, at a value of $10 um, to be spent at the farmer's market on fruits and vegetables. So by um, partnering with the farmer's market and using this model, uh, we're able to help reduce some of these barriers of affordability of healthy foods as well as access. So following our 16 week program in 2017, uh, we were really encouraged to see that we saw positive and significant uh, changes in health and that included significant decreases in total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol, hemoglobin A1C, and an increase in HDL cholesterol or the good cholesterol. So then in 2018, we expanded on our program mat model because we were able to secure additional funding 
So we added a control group as well as an additional 16 weeks to the program that immediately followed the close of the farmer's market season. So these uh, participants, they still um, had 16 weeks worth of farmer's market vouchers. Then we switched them to a meal voucher um, uh, program. So they were still required to walk, but what we did was we partnered with Kane Community Kitchen and we worked with them to develop nutritious uh, recipes that were culturally acceptable and included uh, vegetables uh, or fruits within the main entree or as a uh, side dish. So we gave participants enough meals uh, to feed their household members and by doing this um, this portion of the program helped address um, those barriers to um, food security of uh, uh, the limited time to prepare meals and also the um, lack of experience in cooking or confidence, lack of confidence in um, preparing a meal. <clears throat> so with the 2018 program, we again saw positive changes in health outcomes. This time it was significant decreases in BMI and waist circumference, and that occurred in the intervention group, and it was beyond that of the control group. We didn't see the uh, changes in the lipids or the hemoglobin A1C that we saw in the um, prior year. But what was really exciting about this program is that this uh, weight loss was maintained uh, during a time of year when the weather transitions to be colder, the days are shorter, uh, there are several major um, food um, holidays that are centered on food. So, uh, and that's because the, the program ran from uh, mid-September through mid-January. So that was really encouraging to see that despite all those barriers, people maintain that weight loss. So important to food security, uh, what was really interesting was the work uh, by my program manager, Annie Kempel, who is also a registered dietitian and an anthropologist. So she um, talked with uh, participants in our walking program, and she found that a very strong social network centered on food emerged um, as a result of our program. And that meant that um, people, you know, shared a lot of that food with their, with their family, with their friends, and with their neighbors. She also found that participants were uh, thrilled to be able to support their local farmers because that was really important to them. And they loved having the opportunity to um, consume this uh, fresh local produce. Um, and finally, the participants reported that as a result of our program, uh, they were able to increase the variety of foods in their diets and, and cooking practices, as well as increasing their access to uh, enjoyable foods. And all of these are important um, outcomes towards improving food security. And uh, now before I hand it off to Katie, I just real quick want to um, acknowledge my uh, community co-PI in this picture in the bottom right is Valerie Horn and her daughter, Callie Blair, who is our community program manager. And without these two, we wouldn't have the walking program. Um, the walking program, the entire concept, the idea was Valerie's. And these two work hard every summer to implement this program for very little to no money. So I'm very appreciative of their efforts and so is their community. So with that, I'm gonna pass it on to Dr. Cartarelli. Thank you. Hi everybody. I'm glad to be off the little island and on the big island with all of you. So um, we're gonna transition to another case study also in Appalachian, Kentucky. Um, this is in Martin County. Next. So Martin County is in more of a northeastern um, location where Dr. Brewer was talking about was more southeastern Kentucky. So the yellow county that's highlighted here that borders West Virginia is Martin County. Um, it was ranked by the U.S. News and World Report as the worst performing white majority county in the nation. It was also this location that in 1964, President Lyndon Baines Johnson launched his war on poverty. This is a, an area that has seen dramatic declines in population as much as 12% between 2010 and 2018. And this is an area like many um, Appalachian communities that was heavily reliant on coal for employment. Um, these jobs have declined 63% between 2011 and 2015. Next. 
Uh, here's a, a, an image of Martin County. It's a community of about 11,000 people, high poverty. Um, Dr. Brewer mentioned food insecurity in Kentucky is 14.9%. So you can see in here in Martin County, it's um, almost 19%. And adult obesity is um, a 40% prevalence. Next. Um, Dr. Brewer also mentioned that these are communities that struggle with basic necessities and Martin County uh, has been in the news for the last couple of years because of their struggle to be able to provide clean water to residents. Um, this has been covered by national media. CNN, for example, said the Kentucky County where the water smells like diesel. I mentioned this for two reasons. One is it does, um, I think, portray the challenges that many of these communities face. Um, but also, when you are trying to promote, um, you know, healthy eating and active living um, and, and residents lack access to safe water, um, there are significant challenges. Next. So um, we received funding from CDC as part of their high obesity program to try to improve healthy eating in this community. And as part of a formative assessment, um, you know, we decided to conduct some focus groups. Um, you know, we went into the community wanting to implement multi-level interventions that specifically included policy systems and environmental components, or PSC. Um, and CDC in particular was encouraging us to take a look at potentially enhancing access to farmers markets. Um, and just to give you additional context, um, recent years, have seen uh, farmers markets diminish in the area with only two farmers participating in this last year. So we conducted a series of five focus groups. Um, we had 34 adults who participated. A majority were female and the mean age was 50. Next. And here's a little bit about what we saw. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing that some of this is, is gonna um, resonate with some of the participants. We really, we, we came to hear of intergenerational differences in perceptions related to farming. Um, here's some direct quotes. Most of my adult male relatives worked in the coal mines and they worked six days a week. My grandpa had the garden, but then my dad's generation is the one quit gardening. You would have probably have to have someone teach people because while there aren't any farmers in the county, they're getting old or they have already died off and heaven forbid the kids would ever have to work in the garden. Next. So when we probed this and, and tried to get at, well, what are the barriers to farming in, an, in this Appalachian community? Here's a little bit of what we heard. Property, I mean, you have to have a good sized place to grow produce. I think some of it too is just don't have that motivation and don't want to do it. It is hard work. It's the new generation, they want what's easy, like something quick. Next. So clearly what we heard were um, intergenerational differences um, in terms of influences on farming. And you know, we wanted to highlight this because I think it's a good example of, of getting broad community input um, before you walk into a community to try to implement PSC programming or really any kind of programming, you know, to address obesity and equities. Next. So based on this information, we pivoted in terms of our approaches. Um, a couple of my colleagues, Rachel and Emily and Heather, who are on, um, conducted a food system analysis that was robust and helped us to understand really where people were getting their, their food. Um, and one of the areas that we came to realize was really important in this community were the food banks. And so, um, you know, looking here at the photos on the right, the top right is an example of how we were able to purchase refrigeration units to put into these food pantries so that they could start to, um, to collect and store and distribute um, items that required refrigeration. In the bottom right there, I wanna give a shout out to one of the two food banks in the area. RAMP, otherwise known as Rock and Appalachian Mom Project. Um, so we're still looking at multi-level interventions, meaning direct education, extension programming, plus PSC interventions. Um, but we're pivoting to, to look at, for example, increasing knowledge and self-efficacy for cooking with increased access to vegetables and fruits via the food banks. We're also looking at opportunities to intervene now in some of the gas stations in the area. Next. 
Um, so again, the, the direct education piece um, is, is got to be a part of this as well. Um, we heard from many in our focus groups that we have, we have to build self-efficacy for cooking. Another direct quote, there is a whole generation just like me that cooking is something we didn't do, so we don't even know how to teach our kids to do that. There's a whole gap. There's a whole gap there, you know. And of course, these recipes, you know, have to be tasty. So another quote, like at the food pantry, they get all these different kinds like peas or different things. They end up throwing them away because they don't know anything to fix with that. So I think this shows how both pieces we view as, as critical components. Next. And then the last thing that, that Dr. Brewer and I both wanted to, to um, bring home was to, you know, emphasize the value when you're working in rural communities, you know, trying to tackle hunger and food insecurity, community academic partnerships are key. And this is a photo of um, our community coalition in Martin County, which is comprised of folks from multiple sectors, uh, most of them outside, you know, the health area. Um, this is important for meeting communities where they are. Um, our Martin County project uses a community engaged approach, um, but another approach is a community-based participatory one where your community members are side by side um, sharing decisions. Next. I think that's it. So thank you for um, hearing from your Appalachian partners in Kentucky. Yeah, I mean, I will say for any students on the line in particular, that Universities Fighting World Hunger was, I would say, one of the most, maybe the most influential tool in, in steering me in the direction that I'm working in now. Um, I was an undergrad and master's uh, student and well, I did my undergrad sociology and I was at Auburn doing the master's degree in sociology and knew that I was interested generally in inequality and um, ways to address, to make, to make things better, to make communities better. And it was universities fighting world hunger that helped steer me in the direction of health and food. And I just uh, couldn't be more grateful to be, um, have the opportunity to be a part of the, the summit, even though it is uh, reconfigured and looks a bit more 21st century today than it did when we were first getting started 15 years ago. Um, so I want to just talk a little bit about some of the strategies that we're using in Mississippi to uh, to address hunger and, and related issues. We are also a, a grantee of the, I didn't hear all of Katie's presentation, this in and out had me a bit uh, thrown off. So um, I am assuming that she talked about the, it sounded like she was talking about the CDC work that they have funded there and, and we have uh, funding on that same mechanism. We are in our first round of funding, so we've not had this support before and we are working across, I think Kentucky just has one county, we are working across 12 counties in Mississippi, nine, nine, excuse me, eight initially, but we have 12 counties that we're responsible to reach. So we are a little more uh, spread, spread out than Kentucky is and not as able to go necessarily as deep in each community. Nonetheless, we're doing similar types of work. So all of our communities that we're working in are rural communities, and it's important for us to uh, both as a team have uh, a, a strong understanding of what are factors that affect rural communities uniquely, as well as to share with our community. So it's not um, sufficient to just assume that because a county is a rural-based county that they, they know what their issues are, their challenges are. They live it every day, but you know sometimes we don't see it. So we developed this infographic that we use to help uh, help our communities see some of the challenges that they do face. Things like um, you know geographical barriers and um, differences in occupations. There, particularly the fact that these are farming communities, um, infrastructure is not as as strong. Demographics, aging. The rural communities are aging. Um, there's a significant digital divide, which is highlighted now more than ever with COVID-19 outbreak, limited access to care, social capital actually can be a, um, a, a, a bonus, uh, in, particularly in the deep south in rural communities. Um, maybe we actually see, in some cases, higher set levels of social capital, these sense, sense of social cohesion. Um, but they have a, a limited um, political voice over, overall. Um, what we are learning is that we have got to partner with the right people um, to amplify political voice. So bringing in partners like Farm Bureau, um, is very, very valuable. We've, not to say that um, 
well, I guess our initial take on this was that rural communities didn't have a strong political voice. Um, and what we have come to realize is that we have to reframe that message to say that we have to find the partners to amplify our political voice. It's not that it's not there, it's just not as overt um, as, as, as we wish it were. Um, uh, just a comment that I failed to make initially, and that is that rural communities are, uh, excuse me, the rurality is defined differently, and, and you all, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but it's important to note that, that you know, Census Bureau has got a definition, and USDA has a definition, and there, there are myriad different definitions, and so, you know, generally, we, we have to look to what our funding agency is and as we consider what, what does it mean to be rural. Um, there are certainly disparities in, in health outcomes in rural communities by race, ethnicity, and poverty levels. Um, they all affect rural county residents in, um, in unique ways. Um, poverty in rural areas reached a 30-year peak in 2013 um, at 18.4%. So it's, it's, not, it's not a good time living in a rural community, um, overwhelmingly. Um, and it certainly poverty layers on with the geographical barriers to create very significant difficulties there um, as it pertains to getting food and, and eating um, healthy diets and getting, getting the right kinds of food um, as well. Um, of these determinants of health, we, we saw that only 9% of metro counties had three or more risk of these risk factors, while among non-metro counties, almost uh, more than 15, almost 20% of the micropolitan or large rural and 30% of nine, four or very small rural counties had three or more risk factors. So again, um, areas where we can intervene. Um, what about rural food insecurity? Uh, the, of course, food insecurity is defined as a lack of consistent access to enough food for an active, healthy life. And I think it was at the first Universities Fighting World Hunger Summit that I, that I heard the idea about uh, food insecurity being sort of a three-legged stool, that it's availability, accessibility, and use. And we work really in that sweet spot, kind of a sweet spot between accessibility um, and use in our work through the CDC project. We're not so much um, uh, looking at availability because we know there's enough food available to feed everyone in the world. It's a matter of getting it to the people, or as I'll say in a few minutes, getting the people to the food. Um, in Mississippi, we are the uh, country's number one state for hunger. Um, 20, almost 25% of our children experience hunger and 56% of our older adults experience food shortages. I will just comment that um, it wasn't until after I left Auburn and went into my doctoral program at the University of Alabama at Birmingham that I really grew a love for seniors, but I have found um, that that is very rewarding work and I, and I always have to include a statistic about older adults in what I do. Uh, here you can see the way the food is, uh, excuse me, the food insecurity is distributed across uh, the country and it, you see it's particularly nested in the deep south. Now before I advance to the next slide, I will say that one thing that Universities Fighting World Hunger taught me is that we've got to look outside of just um, the food distribution and food access and really consider what are the upstream factors that need to be considered in addressing hunger. We would often say uh, everybody has a seat at the table when we talk about hunger and food insecurity. And, uh, and we were careful in the early days of this movement at Auburn to be sure that even uh, that the humanities and that everyone was, was at the table. So when I saw uh, this slide that, um, well, this slide shows some of the other factors that affect food insecurity. And you see, excuse me, that, that are related like obesity prevalence, again, the food insecurity, um, poverty rates, you see that it's all hot, this deep south is all hot spots. And it's important though that we take a historical look and look at uh, and, and consider what else has been going on. And you see that these are the same counties where there were deep pockets of slavery um, from the 1860s. You've got a U.S. Census slave map from 1860. And, and I just, I have to always say that it is, it, it's imperative that we consider the historical um, context for where we're working and why, uh, what, what has caused this disadvantage to, uh, to persist. And we, I mean, I, I just argue that this, this disadvantage that we see now is a byproduct of inequality that runs way, way, way deeper than anything that, uh, that, that, that just started or just begun. 
and we've got to be um, fighting racism and and promoting um, equity, not just equality. And the great thing that's come out of the, the the work of Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in the last several years is this emphasis on equity over just equality. We've got to find a way to um, to raise the levels of access. So uh, similar to Kentucky, we're taking a PSE approach to what we're doing. Um, I don't want to rehash what Katie likely talked about, but you know, as y'all know, policy systems and environment um, approaches to addressing hunger um, and food insecurity. They 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 work in this in the areas where people work, live, and play. And in the deep south, we like to say worship or pray as well, because churches are very much a, a part of uh, the the community infrastructure here. Um, they work hand in hand, but they're not linear. It's not like we can just affect the policy change. That, then we work on systems and environment. We have to work in tandem and with different partners to make this happen. We take also a community engaged approach in which we're engaging advocates around the community, policymakers and, and others to help us decide how we can move forward. We have uh, essentially, I um, will put my sociologist hat on and use a, a language from my sociology training, but essentially a constrained choice model where we give the communities options for interventions that we can introduce, but they do have some say and some drive in what, what we do. Our overall approach is to uh, increase and amplify the assets of the communities and decrease or reduce the barriers, the things that are preventing, um, but we want to prevent and reduce food insecurity, so we're working to prevent that. Um, we, we work, take a coalition-driven approach, uh, bring our coalitions together, we um, build work and master plans together, design community action programs, um, implement those programs, evaluate our work, and continue to provide technical assistance and training to them. Um, now, in our communities, we are often asking them to help us identify their assets uh, because we don't know what they perceive as their assets. We can look at some data and do some, some quantitative work, and we have done that, identified some of those things, but we always want the community's um, engagement, ask them as well about their barriers, take a look at what they want to do next as a community, and help them help us help us help them uh, and identify how we can how we can move things forward. Um, we are working on controlling portion sizes in restaurants, doing um, healthy healthy food option and portion control signage, and and utilizing community champions, local champions, um, including the policymakers, food policy councils, and other community. Um, driven coalitions. We're working through farmers markets, farm to schools, mobile markets and corner stores and act, active transportation and again doing the asset mapping. Uh, we're working increasingly this year in food pantries and I hate I didn't get to hear all of Katie's presentations but I'd love to hear more about what they're doing. Uh, we are we are trying, to, we, we have a strong partnership with our Mississippi Food Network and have their buy-in to help convert as many pantries in our counties are interested and willing to a, uh, a choice food pantry model where clients are able to come in and, and have say in what they get and, and it's again a constrained choice model they don't get to just you know load up on all carbs or all meats or all proteins but they but they get some say in what they're doing um, we're also working in the space of physical and physical activity space this shows a, um, a we were able to work in Marks Mississippi which is this the town where Martin Luther King jr. launched his uh, poverty the um, the excuse me, the poverty campaign in the, in the 60s where he took a mule train, the mule train, where he took mules and, uh, and with, with people that he picked up along the way, all the way from Marks, Mississippi to DC to talk and promote this issue related to poverty. Um, and so there is a, quite a bit of work that's been going on there the last several years. We've dovetailed with, with that, those efforts and have enhanced the walkability and bikeability of that community. They've also gotten an Amtrak stop and the reason that i didn't say this the reason that mlk started there because it was the poorest city in the country um, at the time of him launching that campaign um, and they we've been able to capitalize on that um, that and with this new amtrak stop their tourism has increased and they've seen uh, about a 1.1 million dollar impact on their community in about 18 months from this uh, from this emphasis and our cdc project has helped enhance the walkability of the community um, we're working on things like street lighting, um, wayfinding signage. These are sample examples from Birmingham, um, Alabama, which we're not working in, but uh, but some examples of some of the things that are that can be helpful. Um, I've mentioned client choice already. 
One of the things that uh, didn't make its way into my, my slides, but I want to just mention is transportation. We're working with a rural transportation um, program out of the State Department of Transportation. It's a federal grant that pa passes through MDOT. We are really um, accepting uh, the, the reality that rural communities are probably not going to have grocery stores come back to them. And as much as we'd like to, to see that happen and promote that, the business people that we sit down with just say, you know, look, you've got to accept it. If there was a business case for grocery stores being in rural communities, business people would put them there and they can't run on charity. So we're going to have to find a way to move past this conversation about trying to get grocery stores to rural communities. And so what I, my, my take on that has been, okay, if that's the way it's going to be, let's find, a, we can't get the food to the people, let's find a way to get the people to the food. And we're doing some of that working with our rural transportation program out of the State Department of Health. Um, they are very excited about that collaboration. Um, I mentioned already again, Client Food Choice, which is a system in which food pantries convert to um, uh, giving the clients ability to select. What, it's not like a full-blown grocery store, but um, it, it is a way for them to have some say in what they do uh, do select. So they, they uh, we, we start with assessing what the food pantry has, we sort and label the food into groups, and then create inventory and logistics, uh, work on work on creating the inventory and, and logistics for the food groups are located so that the clients are able to, to select some of those things. Um, this is a photo from a choice pantry where you can again see the food is stacked up. People get to decide, okay, I want you know, these, I get these three protein selections this week. Well, I want to get, I want to take this one or that one. Or what, what is it I want? And, and uh, this is a, a sample of that. It provides, it, it's more than transactional then it becomes really dignifying and again, giving them the options for what they have. So I will uh, hush up now and we can move on to the next one. I'm happy to take questions. I'll look in the chat box to see what might have come my way while I was talking and so I can respond to some of those. But thank you all for the opportunity to present. I'm happy to share with you more about the work we're doing um, and contextualize some of um, the data you see for, for the Deep South for those of you that have questions.